So the hint points you to where you can find help. Um, if uh, you go to section 12.1, the very first example is one dealing with a dead exact situation. And th there is an approximation being made here, which is that, um, so bio savart law, it um, applies to an infinitesimal segment of the current carrying wire. And as they do in this, uh, uh, in this example, calculating magnetic fields of short current segments, they, um, so, you know, this is the statement of Bio Savart's law and um, they are treating the segment of the wire as being small enough that um, using this directly without integrating over the thing will be accurate enough. And we'll, and we'll be using the same approximation because that that's, <laughs> makes things simpler and <laughs> that's the purpose of this question. So, so, it, uh, so the thing that simplifies this question is that it's uh, asking magnetic field due to this uh, small segment of wire this segment here. And this is uh, drawn into scale. And uh, um, this the length of this segment is relatively short compared to this distance here or this distance here. So, so what we are going to be doing in this question is we are going to take uh, Bio Savart's law, which gives the infinitesimal contribution to magnetic field due to an infinitesimal segment of wire, current carrying wire. And the rest of the equation reads as IDL cross R hat divided by R squared. And there's a constant here, which your textbook uh, writes as mu naught over four pi. And I'm going to try writing this differently. This is kind of going with uh, the other thing that I was trying, where it comes from an um, advice I got from another experienced physics teacher. He, he retains the use of the Coulomb constant throughout the entire course. And if I were to do that, then this coefficient would uh, look like a Coulomb constant divided by C squared. This is making use of, and you know, you might, it might look like this C comes out of nowhere. What is that C? This C is the speed of light. And that still doesn't answer the question. <laughs> why, why, are we, why are we talking about speed of light? <laughs> and, um, this is uh, uh, something that you can find in the, the, the useful information in the appendix about the constants. The speed of light is related to the electric and magnetic constants this way. One over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. So, so when you have constant speed of light, electric constant and magnetic constant, there's really only uh, two free parameters or two constants that have to be determined. And the third one is um, determined through this relationship. And in writing this expression here, what I'm doing is I'm keeping the, uh, the electric constant, Coulomb's constant, and instead of uh, introducing another constant um, that your textbook does, permeability of free space, I'm just using speed of light. And uh, this, will, uh, this oddity will, I think, will become more clear at the end of the semester when we talk about electromagnetic waves. So I guess that's a bit of a spoiler, but that'll come in the week 16. So. Um, so I'm going to use it that way and I'll plug in the numbers this way and I think it will all still work out. Um, for this question, I'll plug in the numbers. I think it will be worthwhile to do that. So, so for the purpose of this question, what we are going to do is we are going to make this approximation that we are, when we talk about the magnetic field, we are only talking about this segment. So we are going to say that magnetic field due to that small segment is equal to that constant uh, times the current times the length of the segment. And I still have the cross product and uh, times R hat over R squared. And the thing that takes the most uh, effort, and this is where I'm telling you, 
Um, if <laughs> you're just trying to memorize formulas, you will run into difficulties is you have to work out the geometry here. So as a reminder of cross product, because um, I, I don't think I ever covered the definition of cross product in this class. We talked about the right hand rule, but I haven't talked about the definition of cross product, I think. Um, I did a cross product review, but I don't know if I did the magnitude of the, the cross product. So if you have two vectors, A and B, then the cross product, A cross B, um, there's a, uh, the way they define it in a math class uh, using the components. Um, and I won't be using it, and it's not for this question. Uh, we prefer to define this in terms of the magnitudes and direction. And magnitude is actually the easy one. The magnitude of A cross B is simply the magnitude of A times magnitude of B times there's a factor that depends on the relative directions. So if this is theta, uh, sine theta. So I hope this uh, is, uh, gives you a bit of a familiarity to something you have seen with the dot product before. If you have A dot product with B, and that actually gave you scalar right away. And uh, the value of the scalar was a, b, cosine theta. So with the dot product, when theta was 90 degrees was when it was zero, when theta was zero when was when this was a maximum. With the cross product, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, when theta is zero, cross product is zero. When theta is 90 degrees is when cross product is a maximum. And so you're, as we are dealing with the magnetism, you're going to see a lot of things that are at 90 degrees to each other because that's kind of the simplest to set up. Um, now in this question, you, there's a situation where you don't have 90 degrees, so you do have to watch out. So this is the one part of the definition of cross product. And the second part is the one where there has been plenty of lecture, the right-hand rule. The A cross B, um, the cross product, the, it gives you a vector and the direction of the vector is perpendicular to both A and B or A and B. And in this geometry, what that means, it has to be perpendicular to the screen. It can be either going into the screen or it can be coming out of the screen. And that determination is made using the right hand rule. So A cross B, it's coming out of the screen. So, um, so here, um, let me draw the vectors that I need to consider here. So the IEL um, hat or IEL vector that should look like uh, current is, hmm, I guess it's not giving me direction of current. Let me just pretend that it's a flowing from left to right, just because that's easy or for my hand to go. Uh, so it's a, a flowing left to right. So this is gonna be I delta L vector. And this uh, both R hat and R squared, they both refer to the R vector. And R vector is the displacement vector. It's the vector that's pointing from the source to the location where you are calculating the field. So this is the R vector. So when you are talking about the R hat vector, that's the unit vector that's pointing in that direction. So, uh, so for point, uh, one thing makes things easier for us, it's that the R hat vector and the IL vector is, they are perpendicular. So we can say that this, uh, um, so for part A, let me write down this expression for the magnetic field. Uh, B is equal to K over C squared times I delta L cross uh, R hat over R squared. Uh, when we take the absolute value, we can say that this um, delta L cross R hat, this is just gonna be equal to delta L um, because the, the magnitude is the magnitude of delta L times R magnitude of R hat, it's a unit vector, so that's one. Sine of 90 degrees, it's one. So the magnitude here will be uh, K over C squared times I delta L over R squared. Oh, so I think I have all the numbers. Let me uh, plug in the numbers um, in Wolfram Alpha. Uh, 
so that it's easier. Um, Coulomb constant divided by speed of light squared. That's the coefficient in front times the current. Uh, they, they tell me 12 ampere times uh, delta L was, oh, you know, I think those, I think those numbers are randomized. So your number won't be the same as my number. Oh, good, uh, 0 0.99 millimeter and divided by, or oh, uh, distance was three centimeters, three centimeter squared. So when I plug in numbers, one thing that will tell you that you are doing something right is that you get answer in the units of uh, Tesla's. So, um, so let's see, 1.2 times 10 to the minus six Tesla is the, um, should be the answer. Um, and if you don't get unit of Tesla, unit of magnetic field, that means you did something wrong. So, uh, so 1.2 E minus six. And so A is the warm up. It's a relatively easy question. If you somehow forgot to take in the angles into account, you will have been fine. Um, it's a B where if you forgot that, you are gonna get into trouble. So, so let me go try going through the same steps for B. So when I try to go through for the same steps for B, this is what I have. Um, the magnetic field at point B, B is uh, the constant K over C squared times it, you know, when I finish writing down, it's gonna look the same as before. What you have to watch out for is that this R is, a co it's the coordinate variable. So it depends on the coordinate. So before this was the R vector. Now with the point B, the new R vector is this vector. Vector from the current element to the point where you are calculating the magnetic field. So uh, it's changed in a bunch of ways. It's changed in direction and it's changed in magnitude. And um, so the change in the magnitude will come in here. Oops, I meant to make it red. The change in magnitude will come in here and change in direction will affect your expression here. So, um, so let me finish writing this down. Um, so when you work out the cross product and you're just dealing with the magnitude, then uh, what this should be is K over C squared times, and this is what you have to remember for the magnitude of cross product, I delta L, um, the magnitude of R head is still one, it's a unit vector. Let me change the direction of R head there. It's still unit vector, but now pointing this way, R head. Um, and now where I used to be able to say sine of 90 degrees one, now I have to say sine theta. And this is the angle theta, the angle between the I delta L and R hat. Um, and, and divided by the um, R squared. And I think, uh, uh, I think I recognize this triangle. It's a three, four, five triangle. So let me save a little bit of work for myself and just give the length the hypotenuse five centimeter. So that's what I'm gonna be plugging in for the R squared here. And uh, I still need to work out the theta. I don't, I'm not given the theta explicitly. So it's uh, something I need to work out. Here, what I prefer to do actually is, um, there's a technique called draw the triangle. I think you've seen it before. And here the triangle is actually already drawn. I can use this triangle here. And I, this is my theta here, which means this is also my theta, just using parallel lines. Then, uh, then this is the triangle from which I can look up any trigonometric quantities. So if I'm interested in sine of theta, well, that's uh, opposite over hypotenuse. Here in this triangle, I know both the opposite and the hypotenuse. So wherever I have sine of theta, I'll put in three over five. Um, instead of you know working out the theta and then putting it through a sign, that'll give me the same answer. So I already know the sign of theta. It's gonna be uh, three over five, and I think I have all the other numbers. So, so let me plug in those other numbers. 
So it's the uh, same coefficient as before, Coulomb constant over C squared times, same current, same length. Now what's changed is I have the sine theta, which works out to be three over five here, divided by, now the distance also changes, five centimeters. And the, when you do all that, you get um, this 2.59 times 10 to the minus seven. And um, so I keep cautioning you that, um, that you, you, the visualization matters, that you have to draw the pictures, you have to work out the geometry because uh, magnetism is complicated. There are enough pieces there. It's, a, it's, it's, it's easy to miss this sign of theta or misunderstand what angle theta it's referring to. And the only way to get it right is by drawing the picture, by considering the geometry, by, um, by visualizing the setup. 